This is the Jacqueline Martian podcast, and I hate intros, so here we go. Go! To be some things, things that you'll come to learn about me in the next few days. I, I am never going to financially recover from this. Point I'm too afraid to ask. When they say 2% milk, I don't know what the other 98% is. It began with me being in eighth grade and watching my sisters graduate and the podium and the speakers were just not very invigorating and it just made me so aggravated that like there's so much you can say to all these people and you are wasting it like you're just telling them what they already know and you're wasting their time so I had this vision that I wanted to do it and the most important thing was I wanted to have something worth sharing I didn't want to create um, a typical speech with stupid puns and jokes that have been said before and you know movie quotes and famous actors I wanted to be like wow Jacqueline was a great speaker and she had something wonderful to say so the first part of needing to write a great speech is have something great to share to share share it like the good news it's it's not rubbing it in their face but it's the great news where you can share that you've changed that you've grown that you're ready to love in a new way and live in a new way that is so impactful and coming out of high school you there's such a standard of what you believe life to be is and there's so much uh, gratitude from that but there's also that you're quickly learning that that is not all life has to offer and that you're ready for that too so you need to be truthful with the audience, but you have to be more truthful with yourself and saying, wow, I'm going to say something brand new and it's what I want to say. Um, the other thing you're really going to need to know is it's going to take a crazy amount of time to get a great speech. The greatest athletes, the greatest performers, the greatest mathematicians devout craziness into their work. And if you know this is something that you are either being assigned to do or you strive to do, you need to be able to put a massive amount of work into it. The thing that you're going to have to know is that you have to put a lot of time and energy into producing great work. And I thought, well, what is the person who's going to beat me? What are they going to do? Well, they're going to... They're going to spend a lot of time on it. They're going to watch every speech on YouTube. They're going to look into professional sp like speakers that I enjoy, and they're going to emulate them. Um, they're going to talk to people who are great writers that they know, and they're not going to have a group of people amp them up. They're just going to produce great work to show off later. So that's exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to to do all those things. So I had a team of people who were my uh, my four English teachers. Three of them only really helps me, but those three were like perfect for. I'd, I'd write like a really good like five or six solid rough draft. Feel something like I could show, and they would give me honest feedback on it, or help me clarify um, certain sentences, or help me better find my voice. One of them. Um, I think his name was Mr. Rischel, and he, I read him the speech after school one day, like walked in and was like, hey, like, it's my little secret project, and I read it to him, and he was like, the speech is great, the intro is shit, and I was shook, and he basically just ripped apart the, the intro that I had created, he says the intro should be the last thing you, you write, so that's my first tidbit, is do not write the intro, you can't wrap the present if you don't even have a present in the first place. So having a group of people, completely necessary. But I didn't create the people that were really close to me. I think it's really hard for people, especially myself, to get feedback from people who have similar perspectives and similar support systems that I do. Like, I'm going to go to you when everyone tells me it's bad. I'm not going to go to you because if you tell me it's bad, who am I going to go to? Um, so I didn't tell them. I didn't tell, like, I literally didn't tell my family. I didn't tell my mom. I think I told my uncle, but that's, like, about it. Um, okay, so going into the actual speech, very important that you create pillars. What are, if you shred the speech up, what is it going to come down to? What, what are the, the lines where you go, yes, that's the truth. That's the truth you're trying to share with us. Um, the thesis from each one. So no matter how long the paper is, it needs to have a point every time you speak of that. And the most important pillar is the first one when you're delivering the speech because if you don't tell the, the first pillar, the first point first, the whole thing's going to crumble because they'll never believe you. If they don't believe the first one, why would, they, why would they come back and keep listening to the second one? Yes, they might be physically in the room, but are they physically with you? 
to have every person's attention attention span. I had 2,500 people in that room. Were they all there listening to me? And once you get them though, once you got them in that hook and you they trust you with giving with their attention and you tell them the story that not that they want to hear, but that they need to hear. That's when they'll continue to listen for the other pillars. And you don't want too many. You can't have 10 points. You gotta, you gotta keep it relevant. And with a high school speech, you can do four. Easy, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior. And with that, you need to create a pattern. So each pattern, each paragraph had its own like soft introduction and like how it brought it to me and how you can simulate the rest of it to the audience, the graduates. But then you can also bring in um, the visuals, the the commentary, um, the people, the scene, and the almost the visual and emotional side of the speech where you can feel like you're there and then it wraps up in the end. So with the visual emotional, it's very specific to understand what your type of diction is. I like to talk very like fluorescently um, with a different type of addiction and more playful. Um, but I also really like to use descriptive words. Don't just say blue, say cobalt blue. Don't just say tree, say evergreen trees. Um, don't just say they're cool, say they wore swag on their neck. Something where it makes it feel more texture and more alive. So when you're listening to the speaker, it feels like you're there with them. Um, and then in the end, you need to tie back together. Um, there needs to be some aha moment. There needs to be that point for the pillar that that's why you're here. And if that's strong enough, it should be easy to transition to the next point. There shouldn't be any like, is she going to keep talking about this? It's going to be, that was the point. Thank you for listening. Here's the next point that I would like you to listen. And another thing with graduation speeches is you need to address the audience how you see them. You need to address the audience for how you see them and how you see yourself from their perspective. They know why they're here, but now you need to tell them why you think they're here. Um, respecting the audience, I'll come back to it later, but in order to do that, you need to make it um, intimate and you need to be um, be vulnerable first and you need to initiate that first, telling them why you think that you are important up there or why, and like my, my reason was I'm just like one of all of you and everyone can listen to that type of story. If you act like you're on a pedestal, if you're doing it for the titles and the accolades and the, oh, well, I'm just gonna go to this university, this Ivy League, or I score this on my SAT, like these numbers define me. Everyone in society hates those people because we're not all like them. We're not the 1%. We're part of the 99 and people better reflect on who they see themselves like. So the more you can humble yourself, the more you can normalize yourself and, nor and normalize your unique, different, weird, funny, learning, beautiful experiences, the more they'll take you on that ride. So giving the actual speech. This is how you need to practice it. Practicing it in chunks and in different parts of your life. Not like different stages of your life, but different aspects of your routine. So I would practice my speech when I was cooking. I would practice it on a run. I'd practice it in the shower. I would try to remember as much as I could right after I, I read it. So I would write whatever I have and then move on to like the next paragraph or whatever and then read it back to myself and read it back to myself and fall in love with the sentences and how I would look up and um, saying it out loud when I was writing it was super uh, beneficial. But the practicing outside, not just practicing it in the same place at the same time doing the same thing, that's not gonna go into your long-term memory. You're gonna have to do it in different um, parts of your world. So I'd be like running in front of my high school on a club team and I'd be practicing the speech outside um, and it would help me learn it in a different way. And I'd have to practice it um, when I was like walking between classes and um, in the shower. And I would practice it listening to music, practice it in dead silent. I would practice just one solid sentences that I kept like would trip, keep, blah, blah, that I would keep tripping up on. And from that, it, you have to practice it in a way where you can switch the scene. So I would do my final performance practice, my dress rehearsal maybe, in front of a mirror. And I would imagine in that mirror that I was on that podium. Now I had been in this building before so I could slightly um, imagine it. But the most important thing was, so when I was in front of the mirror, I would practice like I'd be in front of those 2,500 people. And then when I got in front of those 2,500 people, I practiced like I was in front of the mirror. And it would calm me down and it would also it would stress me up but also calm me down so when it actually happened i was totally in control there was not one moment 
Oh, there was one moment. There was one moment where I made eye contact with one of my friends and saw them laugh, and then that threw me off a little bit. So don't I got contact with anybody <laughs> um, because it might throw you off. Okay, and then the select group of people to critique you brought this up earlier, and like in the writing process, I had my English teachers um, help me. But once I finalized and said, yes, this is my graduation speech, um, I want to get some live feedback on it, I would break it into two groups. Read it to, reading it to some and having some read it to themselves. So in my first group, I only had one of my really close friends and one random person I barely knew. And I read it out loud to them because I wanted to know like, if you think this is good, this means I did a good job. And if you think this is good, that means my work is a good job. So those were the two things I wanted to put together. So I knew I could do that. And then letting others read it to themselves, I wanted the speech to be able to stand on its own, that even if I didn't read it, it was a great speech. And then thinking of your audience, especially um, when you go up there, people know when you're a crummy speaker because, this is my theory, people are permanently in an audience. I'm an audience when I walk into someone's home and I see how they decorated it. I am an audience when I watch TV shows and radios and theater and podcasts. I'm an audience when I go to school. I'm an audience when I go to a grocery store because you are consistently judging and analyzing the situation and how you can fit into it. So when people say, imagine the audience in their underwear, total bullcrap. Don't listen to that because if you're talking to someone and you imagine them in their underwear in a vulnerable state and it makes you proud, that's going to make you look like a jerk. That's going to make you look like a know-it-all. That's going to make it look like you're above everyone. If it somehow gives you comfort, that's cool, but I don't think that's true. And that's not going to make me a better performer. If anything, I'm going to try and perform in front of, you know, the love of my life or the queen of England, if anything. So respect them for how they are because they know how to be a good audience member and it feels so much better when you earn that respect back not because you feel better than them but because they trust you with what you're saying with your saying okay and then as you're writing the speech you need to understand that you need to it takes a long time I, I wrote it six months beforehand because I wasn't sleeping that night those nights because I just gone through a really bad breakup and there's nothing better than a good breakup that'll make you write a great graduation speech and um, I would write it for a week and every night. You know, when I was up crying, I'd, be, I'd, I'd write it before I go to bed. I'd fall asleep. I'd wake up. I'd write. Um, I would record myself saying stuff, like, just, like, that would come into my mind and then uh, listen to it back later. And then after I'd, like, go crazy for, like, a week, it would be crummy. It wouldn't be great. It's probably, like, 10% of what it was actually, like, right in the, the actual speech. But I would take two weeks off and let my brain relax and listen to other speeches and just be an audience member for other types of entertainment. And I'd come back to it and be like, oh, this is what I need to say. This is how it needs to be said. This is the pattern I've created. These are the pillars. Um, and I would tweak some things. And then I'd go back and write for three days a day and then take a month off and then powerhouse and do two more weeks and write it during my six period, um, like no class time before practice. And with, with allowing yourself not just to do it in one, it's not a homework assignment. Like, you don't, like, just start and finish. It, like, it, it lives, it breathes, it, it takes time. And then another question is, like, how long should the speech be? How long should a movie be? If you're doing a children's movie, it should probably be, like, an hour because children don't have an attention span. But if you are saving Private Ryan, you need three hours. It doesn't matter the length of the speech. The most important thing is what you're saying, how you've changed, how you've grown, how you're still growing, how thankful they were for the ride, how you learned it, what you're going to do about it. Because people, they're like, oh, their attention span is only this much. No, some people, they fall in love with podcasts and they'll listen for hours on end because they're hearing something that they needed to hear and they didn't know they needed to hear it. So that's why they're there. The point of storytelling isn't about how you deliver it. it isn't about you know your vocal in inflections it isn't about um, how many times you've practiced it with in, like how you use your hands if you care enough about writing your story and what you're saying about your story it will flow like a river from you into your audience and they'll they'll see your authenticity and they'll listen to every word you have to say every emotion you provoke they will feel they will believe you when you say thank you 
you know, thank you for listening. And they're going to be like, no, thank you for telling us. That is a great speech. So don't worry too much about, you know, becoming something that the audience wants. Become something the audience needs to hear and, and tell a great story from that. So I'm going to release more of my speeches um, on my channel. Thank you for listening to my first episode of this podcast. Um, I hope this helps people who write their, um, their speech in, in the future. If you have questions, please um, put them in the comments below. I might make another one of these videos or I'll just reply there. Um, but yeah, really best of luck doing all that. It's, uh, it was a blessing and an honor to do it. And I hope it helps. See you in the next one.